Shalom, friends. Welcome to this Shi'ur in Talmud. We're studying Masechet Brachot, that's Tractate Blessings. And indeed, that is what this Gemara is really all about. It's filled with blessings and beautiful teachings. I'm Eliyahu Shir, coming to you from Chesed Ve'emet. You can find my site on www.lovingkindness.co. And feel free to be in touch with me about any questions that you have in Torah and the subject that we're learning, any comments, please feel free to be in touch. So we're learning from the Steinsaltz Gemara, the Korean Talmud Bavli. And as you can see, it's a very beautiful edition. We have in front of us the original text as it appears, as you see in the middle of the page, as well as some notes and biographies, halakha, pictures, photographs, illustrations, and so on and so forth. And all of this helps us to learn the material so that we can really master it much better. Please feel free to follow along on the translation on the side. If you're not happy with something that I'm saying, please take a look on the side and see what the translation is given as. Or if I've missed a note or something, please feel free to take a look at it while we progress through the Shi'ur. So we're learning about in our Mishnah, where we left off last time, we're actually on Daf. Yud Gimel Amud Base, that's 13b. And we're speaking about this Mishnah related to various questions about the Kriyat Shema, things about having Kavana in reciting the Kriyat Shema, things like, for example, making interruptions in the Kriyat Shema and the blessings and various other matters that pertain to the recital of the Kriyat Shema. So we're continuing now on this next theme, which takes things just one step further. Omar Rabbi Ila, Berei de Rav Shmuel Bar Marsa Mishmei de Rav. Said Rabbi Ila, the son of Rav Shmuel, the son of Marsa, in the name of Rav. Omar, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. A person was reading the Kriyat Shema. So he said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, o Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. That's what he said. And then, he fell asleep. In other words, his, his sleep overwhelmed him and he, he couldn't take it any longer. Just after reciting the first line of Kriyat Shema, he already was exhausted and he fell asleep. What's the din? What's the law with regards to the recital of the Kriyat Shema? Yatsa, says the Gemara, he fulfilled his obligation. As long as he said that very first sentence, he fulfilled his obligation of reciting the Kriyat Shema as he should have. Omar le Rav Nachman le Daru Avdei said Rav Nachman to Daru his servant. The Pesukah Kama in the first line, Taran, please bother me. Which means to say, he asked his servant, in the event that you see me falling asleep, give me a bit of a nudge and wake me up so that I can recite that first, I can recite that first line. Tefei, more than that, Lord to Tyran, don't disturb me, which means to say, don't worry about it, whether it is that I fall asleep afterwards or whether it is that you don't have to worry about it because I'm reciting it. Either way, you don't have to bother me any longer. Amale Rav Yosef, le Rav Yosef, Bere de Rava, said Rav Yosef to Rav Yosef, the son of Rabba, Avuch, your father, Heiki Hava Avit. What did he used to do? On Marley, he said to him, kama, in the first verse, have a car nafshe. He really put in the effort, he bothered himself to make sure that he'd be able to recite the first line of the Kriyachma as he should. Tefei, onwards, further, lo have a nafshe. Further than that, he did not bother himself. And therefore, whatever happened, happened, whether he said it with Kavana, whether he fell asleep. I'm not quite sure what happened to him. But the main thing is that that's what well, his custom was, that he would bother himself for the first sentence. And then afterwards, if something happened, something happened. Everybody knows you're davening. And sometimes it's so easy to find one's concentration going off track and perhaps even one's eyes closing. Perhaps it was a late Shabbos evening. And one is in davening the next morning and one kind of is falling asleep. 
And uh, just after the Shema, one's eyes close and one doesn't know where one is, let's say, for example. Or, of course, in the evening, if one is saying the Kriyat Shema and one is feeling exhausted, he's had a hard day of work and he's busy davening and he says the first line and he falls fast asleep after davening, it, it, just that first line. Omar Rav Yosef. Okay, here we see in the notes. Let's just read here what it says in the notes. It says, bother me to recite the first verse. After the first verse, he could continue reciting Shema to the end, while not fully awake, as the primary intent must be upon the first verse. Others explained that he wanted to be woken for the first verse, and once he accepted the kingdom of heaven, he would not fall back asleep. Oh, halakha, bother me to recite the first verse. If one is sleeping, he must be roused from his sleep in order to recite the first verse of Shema fully awake. Thereafter, he may continue reciting Shema while nodding off. Okay. The Gemara continues. Omar Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef said, Praktan. What does the word Praktan mean? Uh, we are told, the commentators tell us that the word Praktan means that a person is lying on his back. Lo yikra kriyat shema. He shouldn't recite the kriyat shema lying on his back. The Gemara asks the question, Mikra hu delo likri. With regards to reading, he shouldn't read it, meaning to say that he reads the kriyat shema while he's lying on his back ha migna shapitami uh, what about sleeping if a person goes to lie down and he's sleeping dafka in that position is that okay all is well for a person meaning to say you tell me that a person should be careful not to recite the kriya shema in a lying down position that means to indicate that lying down of itself is not a problem it's only if you lie down when you recite the kriya shema but the gemara says that's a difficulty because we know that in halakha, one should avoid lying down on one's back because of various things. One's attention could be distracted with various thoughts that go on in one's mind. It seems to be that the rabbis come to tell us that when we are lying on our sides, it is less likely to, that we'll be distracted by certain thoughts that enter our mind, negative thoughts that could enter our mind if we lie on our stomachs or if we lie on our backs. Therefore, the Gemara asks, would it be acceptable to lie down and sleep that way? Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi used to curse somebody who would be lying down in this position on his back, which means to say it's not an appropriate thing to do. Says the Halakha, one who is lying on his back may not recite the Shema, one is prohibited from reciting the Shema while lying on his back or stomach. If he leans to his side, it is permitted. According to the Shulchan Aruch, if it is not extremely burdensome, one should sit up. The Ramah disagrees and is lenient. The language, praktan, this is what we get this advantage when we're reading from this Gemara, is that he helps to explain these various terms that we might not necessarily get. In this particular instance, we do get it from the commentators themselves, but here we are, he's explaining it to us. This term can mean either lying on one's back or on one's stomach. In addition to Rashi's explanation, some explains that this position is prohibited because it may lead to inappropriate sexual thoughts. And so therefore, when we recite the Kriyat Shema, we should be careful not to be doing it on our backs or on our stomachs, of course. The Gemara also mentions, in any case, when one sleeps, one should be careful not to sleep on one's back or on one's stomach, but rather on the side. Omri, so they said like this, Migna, if one lies down, Kimatsle, if one leans, Shapidame, all is well. Mikra, when it comes to reading, Af al Gav de Matsle, even though he's leaning, Namiyasur, he should not even lean on his side when he davens the Kriyat Shema. The Gemara continues. Rabbi Yochanan But hold on a second. Rabbi Yochanan, he used to recline and read. The great Rabbi Yochanan in the Gemara, he himself used to recline on his side when he would recite the Kriyat Shema. The Gemara answers, Shainai Rabbi Yochanan, the Baal Basar Hava. Rabbi Yochanan is different because he was a fleshy man, which means he was overweight. He was a fat man. And as a result, it was very difficult for him to sit up in an ordinary sitting position in order to recite the Kriyat Shema. He had to be in a position whereby he was almost lying down. And what he would basically do is 
tip himself over to the side ever so slightly so that he wouldn't be lying down completely on his back. And that is the way that he would recite the Kriyat Shema. But Parakim, in the chapters, which means to say we're now going back to the Mishnah. And the Mishnah says to us that there are certain types of interruptions that we're allowed to make when we recite the Kriyat Shema. Depending upon the position that we find ourselves in, we can answer or ask about certain things to people along the way relative to where we are. So the first part of the Mishnah said, Baprakim. In between the paragraphs, Shoel, one may ask, and then the Mishnah continued. Meshiv, the, the Gemara asks, asks a question and says, according to the Mishnah, the wording was not explicit. And it just said over there that he can ask, and then afterwards it says he can answer. But it didn't say what he's allowed to answer. Meshiv, Mechamas, Mai, the Gemara asks, what is it that he may indeed answer? Because according to the Mishnah, the Mishnah makes no mention of what it is that he can say. Ilema, if you say, Mipnei HaKavod, that he may answer on account of honor, Hashta, now, hold on a second, Mishal Sha'el, in asking about a person's welfare, he may certainly do so out of honor. Ahadure Mibaya, when it comes to answering, does he, do we need to know that he can answer? If he can ask out of honor, out of respect, somebody walks past him, and out of respect, he needs to ask this person, how are you doing? Is, is all well with you? Because he respects the person. So certainly he may answer. And therefore, what does the Mishnah come in to teach us? That he may answer out of respect. If he can ask out of respect, then Kalva Homer, all the more so, he may answer out of respect. Ella, but rather, Shoel Mipnei HaKavot, he may ask somebody out of honor, respect, how are you? And when it comes to answering somebody, in fact, he may answer as his welfare to everybody, which is more lenient. Asking is more strict. Answering is more lenient. Asking, you have to be strict about. So you have to be careful about it. Sorry, you have to be careful about the, about the, about the asking. But answering, one may be lenient about it because already somebody else has asked us this question. So therefore, we can answer to everybody. Ema Seifa. So say the end. Over Emta. And in the middle, Shoel Mipneha Yira Umeshev. We have a problem. What's the problem? Over there it says, you may ask, or we may ask on account of fear. And we may answer. Once again, the language of the Mishnah is not clear. It says, in the middle, one may ask out of fear. And one may answer. But it's missing something. What may we answer? May shiv, may hamas mai. What can one answer about? Ilema, if you say mipnei hayira, that you can answer about fear, meaning to say, if you fear the person, you're allowed to answer only on account of fear. Hashta mishal sha'il. But here already you're asking on account of the fear. If you can ask on account of fear, then surely the lesser the lesser evil, so to speak, you can definitely answer. Do we need to say that you can answer? Ella, but rather, this is the answer. On account of honor, on account of respect. So this would be what Rabbi Yehuda said. As the Mishnah taught, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, but enter in the middle of the Kriyat Shema, which means not between the paragraphs, but in the actual middle of the Kriyat Shema. Shoel mitnei hayira, one may ask somebody of his welfare if one feels in fear of the person. For example, if it's a great person who walks past, he could say, off with your head, if we don't greet him. So under these circumstances, one may ask the person, oh, your majesty, how are you? Umei shiv mitnei kavot. And one may answer not on account of Yira, but rather one may answer on account of only of honor, of respect. You may only answer on account of respect. Uba prakim, and in the middle of the, in the middle, meaning to say between the different paragraphs, shoel mitnei kavod, one may ask on account of respect. Umei shiv shalom lechol adam, 
and one may answer to everybody, which means it's a much easier category to deal with. You may answer to everybody, but in terms of asking, one must be more careful to only ask those people who one honors, not that one just gives over oneself that one can only, that one can ask everybody. You may not ask everybody. The Gemara continues. Chasure maxera vahaki katani. According to this, the text that we're reading is lacking something. Chasure maxera. Vahaki katani. And this is really what it should have taught, which means to say that it could be perhaps that when the Mishnah was compiled for some reason, certain words were taken out, or perhaps when it was written down at that point in time, the certain words were left out and they should have really been put in and for some reason they were left out. And therefore, what should the words have really said? It should have said like this. Baparakim, in between the paragraphs, Sho'el mipnei hakavot, one may ask on account of honor, uh, respect, meaning to say that one gives honor to a person, and therefore you can ask them, how are you doing? And you don't even have to say that, of course, you can answer. And in the middle of the Shema, which means when one is in the actual middle between sentences, one may ask on account of fear, which means to say, it's, 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 it's a harder section. It's a harder part to deal with if you're in the middle of the Kriya Shema. So that's a part where you wouldn't want to make a, a hefsek. You wouldn't want to make a separation. Whereas between paragraphs, it's kind of more lenient because at least you finish the paragraph. So we say that you can ask a person how he's doing out of fear. And of course, you don't have to say that you can answer out of fear. Of course, you can answer out of fear. If you could ask out of fear, you can certainly answer out of fear. Divrei Rabbi Meir. These are the words of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda Omer. Rabbi Yehuda says, Ba'imta, in the middle, Sho'el mipnei hayira, one may ask on account of, in me to say, this is his opinion, Rabbi Yehuda is saying, in the middle, one may ask, mipnei hayira, on account of fear, but not on account of kavod, or may shiv mipnei kavod. And according to Rabbi Yehuda, it's not meshiv to everybody, but rather it is meshiv mipnei kavod. One may only answer on account of honor. If you have respect for somebody, but not necessarily yira, you don't fear the person, it's not as bad. So then we say, you may answer somebody on account of honor. Uba prakim, and during the Shema between the different paragraphs, Sho'el mipnei kavod, one may ask somebody if one is respecting that person and wants to show them honor. Umei shiv shalom l'chol adam. And according to Rabbi Yehuda, one may answer of one's welfare to everybody who asks. Let us see this inside here, the background. Chasure maksara. This method of explanation where we say the Mishnah is incomplete is often found in the Gemara. However, generally speaking, it does not suggest an actual emendation of the text of the Mishnah. The addition introduced by the Gemara is a necessary elaboration upon that which is written in the Mishnah, which is insufficiently clear in its current form. The addition provides the necessary clarification. The Ain Sarik Lomar, and needless to say, the addition of the words and it goes without saying, resolves the difficulty raised in the Gemara by inference. Obviously, if one may initiate a greeting, one may respond. Why did the Mishnah write both? By inserting the phrase, and it goes without saying, it is clear that the Mishnah was also aware of the relationship between greeting and response, and there is no difficulty. Let us continue. Tanya Namihachi, it was also taught in a brighter, the following, which means to say we're going to learn a similar type of teaching or perhaps exactly the same teaching in another brighter. What did it say? A person was reading the Kriyat Shema and he encountered his teacher or Gadol Heimenu or somebody who is greater than he is. Baprakim, when he finds himself between paragraphs, Baprakim during the paragraphs, meaning from one paragraph to the next, Sho'el Mipnea Kavot, he may ask a person how he's doing if he wants to be showing his respect. The person is due, due respect is due to this person. One may even stop reciting the Kriyachma, turn to the person and say, How are you? And you don't have to say that's an expression that we just learned above. 
Shehu may shiv. Of course he can answer. If he's allowed to ask, then for sure he can answer. Or ba emta. And in the middle, which means he's in the middle of the paragraph itself. Sho'el mitnei hayira. He may only ask when it comes to matters of fear. He fears for his life. Something could happen. Then he may ask uh, directly to this person, how are you? But he cannot ask out of kavot, but he can ask out of yira. And it's not necessary to say that certainly Shehu may shiv, if the person who he's, he's due to give fear to, that he has fear to this person, that he can uh, ask him how he's doing, then for sure if the person himself asks him how he's doing, he may certainly answer. Divre Rabbi Meir, these are the words of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, this is again the other teaching in another brisa. We see the same two opinions here. It's just expressed slightly differently. Rabbi Yehuda says, Ba'emta, in the middle of the paragraph, Sho'el mitnei hayira, a person may ask on account of fear, or may shiv mitnei kavot. But according to Rabbi Yehuda, he may not just answer, uh, he, may, he may not answer only somebody on account of fear. He may even answer somebody on account of of respect, of uh, of kavod, of honor. Or paprakim, if a person finds himself in the middle of a paragraph, according to Rabbi Yehuda, sho'el mitnea kavod, he may ask the person how he's doing, if he wants to show honor to this person, or may shiv shalom l'chol adam, and the truth of the matter is, it's not just that he can answer this person, but he can even answer other people as well. He can answer everybody, on how he is doing. Somebody asks him, how are you doing? He may answer, I'm doing okay. And he may answer this to everybody. Let us continue. Achai, who was a Tana, in the school of Rabbi Chia, he asked from him, from Rabbi Chia. What does this mean that he was a Tana? Let's see the background. Even though, Writing the oral law, the oral Torah, was permitted. Most of it was not recorded. Some say that the Mishnah itself was not written at the time of its redaction. Therefore, many rabbinic statements, such as the Tosefta and other Braithot, were preserved and transmitted orally. Each sage was expected to commit the entire Mishnah, as well as significant amount of other Tanayatic statements to memory. However, complete mastery of all these sources was the province of the Tanaim, experts at memorization who memorized massive amounts of material and were capable of reciting it on demand. Often the most prominent of these Tanaim were affiliated with a specific study hall of one of the sages where they served as living anthologies of this material. So this is what we're learning about over here that that this Achai who was a Tana in the school of Rabbi Chia asked a question from Rabbi Chia. Let's take a look at the notes here. Despite the fact that these Tanaim were extremely well versed in the Mishnah and Braithot, they often understood them on a superficial level and rarely examined them critically. Therefore, these analytical dilemmas raised by these two Tanaim cited in the Gemara. Therefore, these, these analytical dilemmas raised by these uh, two Tanaim are cited in the Gemara. Others explain that these two dilemmas were cited together by the Gemara because in both cases, the one who raised the dilemma received a, receives an answer more lenient than either of the options raised. So this is what's going on. We must imagine that even though it is that he was a very great man, there were still various dilemmas. And even though he himself was a great Tana, he went up to his Rebbe, Rabbi Chia, and he asked him this question. The Hallel. When it comes to the recital of Hallel, today is Rosh Chodesh. Everybody knows on Rosh Chodesh we recite Hallel. And we know that there was Sukkot recently. Sukkot we recited Hallel. Pesach, we also recite Hallel. So there are various occasions that we recite the Hallel, a very special prayer dealing with praise to Hashem. Over Megillah and reciting the Megillah. Everybody knows coming up to Purim, not so long to go. And when we recite the Megillah and when we recite this Hallel, Mahu Sheyafsik. What is the din? What is the law with regards to making an interruption? We've just been dealing with interruptions related to Kriyat Shema. Inside the paragraph, between the paragraphs, what type of thing can you answer? What type of thing can't you answer? And so on. Now, this particular Tana asks from Rabbi Chia, Rabbi, can you please tell me, 
What is the din with regards to the recital of Hallel and the Megillah in terms of making interruptions? Amrinan Kalvachomer. We say a Kalvachomer. Kalvachomer, one of those special ways of studying the Gemara. A Kalvachomer is a lenient and strict, which means to say we learn out one opinion from the other opinion. If in the one case this and this happens, then certainly in the other case, which is going to be a more lenient case, we can definitely apply the same principle. This is a kal vachomer. We can learn out an easy case, really, from a more stringent case. If in the more stringent case such a thing was permitted, it would certainly permit, be permitted in the more lenient case. Kal vachomer. What is the kal vachomer? Kriyat Shema, the Orisa Posek. When it came to the recital of the Kriyat Shema, isn't it true? That the Kriyat Shema is a mitzvah de oraisa. It is a Torah mitzvah to recite the Kriyat Shema. And the rabbis already told us, as we've learned in this Gemara, posek, a person may make a hepsik. Therefore, halel de rabbanan mibaya. When it comes to halel, which is really a mitzvah de rabbanan, it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah any mitzvah to recite halel. No, it doesn't say when it comes to sukkot and you shall recite the halel. Yes, it says you shall take the etrog and the lulav and you shall shake them and you shall sit in Sukkot. Fine, it says all those things. But uh, it doesn't tell us anything about reciting Hallel. Also, the mitzvah of reading the Megillah on, on Purim, there is no such a mitzvah in the Torah. Can anybody point out a mitzvah of reciting the uh, Megillah on Purim? If you look into the Chumash, does it say somewhere there we need to recite the Megillah? Now, if it is that we can make a hefzik when it comes to a Torah mitzvah, surely we would be allowed to make a hefzik when it comes to a rabbinical prayer of sorts. Or Dilma, or perhaps the Gemara says, Pirsume Nisa Adif. Perhaps the, uh, the publicity of the miracle is stronger than the Torah mitzvah, which means to say when we recite Hallel, the whole idea of the Hallel is acknowledging the miracles that God did for us or the special things that God did for us, taking us out of Egypt, we eat matzah on Pesach and uh, taking us out of Egypt. So we sit in the sukkah for, the, for those days, for that week and so on and so forth. We see that perhaps it's about publicizing the miracle that occurred when it came to Purim, when it comes to Purim, we know that there, another miracle occurred and the Jewish people were saved from the wicked Haman who was out to destroy the Jewish people. And therefore, when we make a comparison between the miracle of Purim and the recital of the Kriyat Shema, which is a Torah mitzvah, maybe we can still make a fair comparison. The comparison is that with regards to the recital of the Hallel or with regards to the recital of the Megillah, since we are doing it as a mitzvah to publicize the miracle, perhaps, in fact, it is no less than the mitzvah, the Torah mitzvah, of making interruptions with regards to Kriyat Shema. So the argument saying, with Kriyat Shema, you may make certain interruptions, Kalva Chomer, you can make the interruptions in Hallel and the Megillah, is not necessarily true. Because perhaps we're more strict when it comes to Pesume Nisa, the miracle, the, pub, the publicity of the miracle, publicizing the miracle. O Malay, he said to him, Rabbi Hia answers back to the Tana, for sake, he may make an interruption, and he doesn't have to worry about it at all. Very interesting, Allah. We know, of course, anybody who goes to Shul on Purim and the Megillah is being read, the first thing that the Gabai of the base Knesset says before the Megillah is ready, tells everybody, please listen here. Do not make a sound except for the clapping and the making noise for reciting Haman's name, which is done in the spirit of the Purim. Nevertheless, don't make any interruption whatsoever. From the time that the Balkaire begins to read the Megillah, don't make any interruption until he's finished altogether. Yet according to the Gemara over here, he said, Posek, he may indeed make a, se a separation, an interruption, and you don't have to worry about it at all. We'll see in a minute uh, exactly what could he be referring to. Omar Rabba, Rabba said, Days 
on which the individual finishes on uh, them the whole Hallel, which means to say there are different days that we recite Hallel. On Rosh Chodesh, we recite Hallel. On Sukkot, we recite Hallel. On Pesach, we recite Hallel. But the Hallel that we recite on these various days is not the same Hallel. On Rosh Chodesh, there are certain paragraphs that we skip. On Pesach, except for the first day, on all the other days, we skip paragraphs. On Sukkot, we recite all the Hallel. Says the Gemara, on those days where the individual must complete the whole Hallel, ben perek le perek posek, then uh, between each paragraph, he may make an interruption, but emtza ha perek eno posek. If he is in the middle of the particular paragraph that he's reading, don't make an interruption. And on those days in which the individual does not complete the Hallel, which means he doesn't recite all the paragraphs of the Hallel. Even if he finds himself in the middle of the chapter, he may make an interruption. Of course, we would need an inter introduction to understand exactly what he's talking about over here. Certainly, according to the opinion, the Psak Halakha, according to the Rambam, who rules over here, as we're going to see in a minute, we we'll look at, we'll take a look at the, at the notes, is that in actual fact, there are many opinions, the Rambam, of course, standing out prominently, who say that when it comes to the recital of the Bracha for the Halal, that if one is going to be doing the entire Hallel with all the paragraphs, one should recite the bracha. However, if one does not recite all the paragraphs, one should not recite the bracha. Well, of course, that explains everything. If you're not going to recite the bracha, then there would be no such thing as a formal interruption of sorts. And that would be on an occasion where we wouldn't be reciting all the paragraphs of the Hallel. And therefore, one could make an interruption. However, on the other days, when we would do do the entire Hallel, on those days, we would make a bracha. And therefore, if we would make an interruption, we would make an interruption proper for the bracha, which would create a problem. So therefore, in that instance, we would be allowed to interrupt, but only between paragraphs, not within the paragraph itself. Any, says the Gemara, is that so? Really? Vaha, Rav Bar Shaba, Ikla, Legabed Ravina, I'm going to tell you a story. There is a story that Rav, the son of Shabbat, he went and visited towards Ravina. Rav, Bar Shabbat, went to visit towards Ravina. And it happened to be on those days when the individual completes, that the individual does not complete the Hallel. And Ravina did not make an interruption for him. What do I learn from this? According to the story, and stories are very important, the story tells us what's happening, what we have to do, practically speaking. We have to see how does the rabbi behave? What are people doing? What's the practical thing? So he goes to this rabbi, and while he's there, it was a day, clearly, that one doesn't have to finish, do all the paragraphs of the Hallel. So he went up to Ravina while Ravina was reciting Hallel. He interrupted him, and Ravina didn't respond to him. That's a clear signal that one shouldn't make an interruption even on those days. The Gemara answers, Shiny Rav Bar Shabba. Rav, Shab, Rav, Rav Bar Shabba was different. The law Hashiva lay the Ravina because he, he, he wasn't considered anything by Ravina. Ravina didn't think much of Rav Bar Shabba and he didn't feel he had to make an interruption for him. And so therefore, he didn't make the interruption. And therefore, it's not a good example to give as to whether or not we're allowed to make an interruption during the time when we recite the Hallel and we're not completing it. Let us take a look at this note over here. Days when the individual completes the entire Hallel. Yamim yachid gomer hallel. The days on which Hallel is recited are divided into two categories. Days when reciting Hallel is a rabbinic ordinance. The first day of Passover, two days in the diaspora, Shavuot, Sukkot, and Hanukkah. And days when reciting Hallel is merely a custom. The remaining days of Passover and the new moon. On those days when reciting Hallel is merely a custom, an abridged version of Hallel is recited. 
With regards to those days, there are differing opinions among the authorities as to whether or not the congregation, as opposed to an individual, recites the entire Hallel, and whether or not one recites a blessing over the abridged version of Hallel. The Gemara continues. Ashian, who was a Tana of the school of Rabbi Ami, asked from him, from Rabbi Ami, another story about a student who was a Tana, who asked his Rebbe a question. Because as he said before, even though he himself was a Tana, doesn't necessarily mean to say that he knew all the answers. So he asked this question. Hasharoi Batanis, a person who is busy fasting. Mahu Sheyitom. What is the din with regards to what it would be that he'd be allowed to taste? Achila, meaning to say, would it be permissible for a person to taste something? A person is fasting. Is it permissible for him to taste something on his fast day? Is tasting considered to be for a, a, a problem of eating? Or is tasting not a problem of eating and he is still considered to be fasting? Achila ushtia kabel alei, v'haleika. When we speak about his fast, we speak about eating and drinking. That is what he accepted upon himself. Vahaleika. But here he's not eating and he's not drinking. Or Dilma, or perhaps Hana'a, Kabel Ale, perhaps he accepted upon himself that he didn't want to benefit even from something that is just plain pleasurable. Hana'a. A, a, he didn't want to benefit. He, he accepted upon himself. He would not even accept. He wouldn't even deal with the aspect of benefit. And of course, isn't it true that tasting does give a person a certain measure of benefit? Vaha'ika. And here we see that there is. He has a benefit. He tastes it. It tastes good. He's enjoying himself. Let us take a look at the notes just before we go to the, the halakha, before we actually go to the next page. And may one interrupt you in the Megillah. One may not interrupt and engage in conversation during the re reading the scroll of Esther. This ruling applies specifically to the listeners who are liable to miss hearing part of the reading if they do so. The reader, however, may interrupt his reading with the same restrictions as one reciting the Shema. So it's very interesting. A person who's reading is actively, he's the person who's doing it. He may actually make a hefsek to do something and he may come back to where he was and continue his reading. But those who are listening may not make a hefsek. And the biggest reason being that the reader of the Megillah is going to read at quite a pace. Right? The Megillah is going to take, let's say, 40 minutes on average, maybe 35 minutes. And it's, a, it's, it, it's at a quick, a quick pace. If the reader of the Megillah reads any slower, people are going to not be able to concentrate. So they won't be able to focus at all. The Megillah reading will go on for an hour, an hour and a half. People won't be able to focus. So he reads it quickly. Another reason, of course, is as the Halakha points out to us, that reading the Megillah is reading an Igeret. It's reading a letter. And when one reads a letter, one reads it from beginning to end. And therefore, as one reads it, one should, generally speaking, not make an interruption. We read the letter from beginning to end. So-and-so is writing us a letter, look at the things that he's saying. Yes, yes, carry on, carry on. So therefore, when we read the Megillah, we have to read it at the same type of pace without causing unnecessary pauses from one sentence to the next. It's a pace that one has to keep. And that's why the Megillah is read at that particular pace. Nevertheless, if the reader needs to take a hefsek, he needs to make an interruption for some reason, he's allowed to. But those who are listening may not. Why? Because if they do, that moment or two that they're speaking to somebody else, uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. They are. He's, he's already missed two lines of the Megillah. And of course, he can't make it up. And the mitzvah is, yes, he has every single word of the Megillah in order to fulfill his obligation. Interruption in Hallel. Havsaka the Hallel. On days when one recites the entire Hallel, the same restrictions apply with regard to interruptions as one reciting Shema. On days when one does not recite the entire Hallel, one may interrupt due to respect and respond with a greeting to any person, even in the middle of a paragraph which relates to exactly what we said before. So we continue over here. The question is being asked with regards to fasting. What is the din? What is the law with regards to tasting food? Is it considered? that he's actually eating, and therefore it's 
forbidden because he made it uh, like he made a, 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 a he made a stipulation basically when he said he's fasting it was not to eat or drink and here he is uh, it may be here he is he's, he's tasting but he's not effectively eating the food or perhaps we should say that when he says i'm not i'm not going to eat anything i'm going to fast fasting is also included within this idea of even tasting because i don't want any physical food drink pleasure of any kind Omalei, Rabbi Ami said to him, Toaim, he may taste, the ain bekach klum, and there's no problem in it. There's no problem with this fellow tasting, because tasting is not considered to be eating. Tanya nami hachi, and it was taught also in the Brisa, which means to say it was also taught the same type of teaching somewhere else. That had different prices, a different brighter. One, one school in one brighter said such and such, another school said another thing, but the teaching is the same. So we want to bring all the teachings in so that people can see that the law is standard. It's constant. Mitemet eino to una bracha. The din is that when a person tastes something, he does not require a blessing on it. If one is tasting the soup, one is a cook, he's a chef, and he's, and he's busy preparing the soup. So he gives it a little bit of a taste on his tongue. He doesn't have to make a blessing when he just puts it on his tongue to taste. But just a little bit on the spoon, just goes just a little bit on his tongue. This is okay. He doesn't need to make a bracha. How come? Because he's not really eating. And therefore, he doesn't benefit in the sense of gaining benefit from food. Rather, it's simply just a taste on his tongue to see whether the food has been correctly prepared. And the person who is immersed in his fast, to aim, he may taste, same category, the aim bekach klum, and there's no problem with that. There's no problem with his tasting. It's the same category of a person who's preparing food, and when he eats it to, 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 to taste it, to see if the food is all right, he's not really eating the food to eat it for the nourishment. He's only tasting it to get an idea if the food is ready. Ad kama. The Gemara asks, when we speak about taste, we need measurement. What's considered to be tasting? If I take a full spoon, is that considered tasting? Is it a teaspoon? What about just a drop on the tongue? What about the full the tablespoon? How much is considered to be in the category of tasting? Rabbi Ami, for Rabbi Asi, Ta'amei Adshi or Riviata. So Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi, when they would fast, according to the notes over here, they would taste up until the measurement of a riviit. A riviit means a quarter of a log, which means a certain type of a, a measurement, which we'll discuss in a minute. And to that degree, they were prepared to have something in, in the realm of tasting, not to be transgressing over the fact that they were involved in fasting. Let us just take a look at this note here. A quarter of a log, riviit, a unit of liquid volume which serves as the standard unit of measurement in certain matters. For example, a quarter of a log is the minimum amount of wine over which Kiddush may be recited. The amount of wine which a Nazarite is flogged for drinking and the minimum amount of certain foods for whose transfer from one domain to another one is liable on Shabbat. On Shabbat. A quarter of a log of blood from a corpse imparts ritual impurity in contemporary terms, the exact amount of a log is subject to dispute among authorities with opinions ranging from 60 to 120 cubic centimeters. Omar Rav, Rav said, the Gemara continues, we finished with that section of tasting, we finished with the section of the Halal, we finished with the section of the Megillah, the interruptions, we go to the next section. Omar Rav, Rav said, Call a Nesen Shalom la Kabero. Speaking about greeting each other, as we did say before, although we're not dealing with the subject of the Kriyat Shema any longer, call them Sheet Palel. A person went to greet his fellow before he davened, which means to say he was davening the Shmon Esrei, of course, he's going to go and daven in Shul. Ki ilu asa o bama. The Gemara says, it is as if he has made. It's as if he has made him into a bama, which means a, an altar of a, an altar. He's built an altar from this 
Well, as a result of greeting the person, it's as if he makes an altar. But when we serve Hashem, of course, we are not allowed to make altars today. There's only one altar, and that is the altar that exists in the Beis Hamikdash. We ourselves are not allowed to engage in making altars. According, therefore, to Ra, a person who greets his friend first is kind of making a type of a worshipping system which goes against the worshipping system of God. He should have first prayed to God, but instead he went off and he greeted his friends as if to say that is a way of serving God. That, that's how he imagines in his head that he's serving God. Well, that is, this is creating a, an altar which is forbidden. Shenema. How do we know that? Because the verse says, Hidlu lachem min ha'adam. Stop from you, from people. Ashen shamabapo, that he has a soul inside himself. Ki For what is he considered? Says the Gemara, Al tikri bame, don't read the verses saying for what is he considered? El abama, but rather he is considered like an altar. That's how we have to read it. Ki bama nekshavhu, he is like a bama. That is what we consider him like. So the person who stopped, in other words, what happens here? When one's soul is breathed in through his nostrils in the morning, he should turn to no one other than God. And what did he do? He turned to his friends before he went off and prayed to God. Let's see it. The notes over here. Anyone who greets another person before he prayed, some explain that the prohibition is primarily due to the fact that when greeting a person, it is customary to politely bow. In so doing, it is as if one is bowing before another prior to bowing before God, and hence the problem. Ushmuel Omar. And Shmuel said, The reason is because he considered this person to be important and not God. In other words, why did he consider this person to be? more important than God, why did he give honor to him? And therefore we see that is forbidden. And so is the general halakha. The custom is, of course, that we do not greet each other in the early morning. But rather, when we arrive for davening, we should immediately settle down as fast as possible to put our tefillin on and to begin our davening. We'll see a little bit more about it in a minute. Let's just continue to the end of the page and then we'll read the halakha. Masiv Rav Sheishis. Rav Sheishis raised an objection. Paprakim in the middle between the different paragraphs. Shayel mipnei hakovod umeishiv. One may ask out of honor and one may answer. Tirgama Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba explained it like this. The mashkim lepitcho. What it means is that, in other words, the question that we were asking ourselves is, if it is that we already read in the Mishnah that we are indeed allowed to ask and answer somebody who asks us how we're doing while we're reading the Kriyat Shema, isn't this, of course, a concept of greeting somebody before we pray? So Tirgam Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba explained that when we say that one shouldn't greet somebody before davening, what it really means is the mashkim lepitcho, when he goes to his entrance, when he goes to his house and he greets him, this is something that is forbidden. It's not if you arrive at davening and somebody says, hi, how are you? And you say, good morning, I'm well and you. He says, fine, thanks, let us begin davening. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a situation where davening is going to begin at 6.30 in the morning and this fellow goes to his fellow's house and he knocks on the door and he says to him, hello, how are you? How are things? This should be avoided until the person has davened himself, until he davens to God. Omar Rabbi Yaina, Omar Rabbi Zaira, Rabbi Yaina said that Rabbi Zaira said, call her Oise Chapatzav Kodem Sheet Palel, anybody who does his things before he prays, it's as if he built an altar. Meaning, when it comes to morning davening, we need to get going as fast as possible to attend to what we have to attend to, to get to daven. In the morning, we should not be engaged in other activity 
until we have davened. If we do engage in other activity, it is as if we have built a bama. Amru law. They said to him, Bama amarat. Did you say? Is that what you really said? An altar? Omar lehu. So he said to them, Lo. No, sorry. You heard the teaching wrong. Asur ka amina. I said it's forbidden. I didn't really say. You made it up. You made up a story that I said it's a bummer. I did not say that he built an altar. What I said, and you should have quoted me correctly, said Rabbi Zaira, said uh, Rabbi Yoina, who said that Rabbi Zaira said it. I really said that it is forbidden to do, not that you are actually building an altar, but it is something that it is forbidden to do. The Kidarav Idi Baravin. And Vikidi Rav Idi Bar Avin, this is like Rav Idi, the son of Avin. To Oma Rav Idi Bar Avin, Oma Rabbi Rav Yitzchak Bar Ashian. That Rav Idi, the son of Avin, said that Rabbi Yit, Rav Yitzchak, the son of Ashian, said, Asur lo la adam la asais chapatzav kodem shi palel. It is forbidden for a person to do his own desires, his own things that he has to do before he prays. Shene Mar, how do we know that? Because the verse says, that tzedek, righteousness, shall go before him, and he shall place his and he shall place his steps on the way. He shall make his footsteps on a path. One should first pray and acknowledge the righteousness of his Creator, and only then should he set out on his way. For Omar Rav Idi Baravin, Omar Rav Yitzhak Barashian, and Rav Adidi, the son of Avin, said that Rav Yitzhak, the son of Ashian, said, Call Hamit Palel, anybody who davits, and afterwards he goes off on a path, he goes off on his journey. Listen to this a person davits, and then afterwards he goes off on his daily activity. Instead of what? Instead of dealing with his daily activity and then davening. If he behaves in this way, it's not only that the Pazog is referring to the way that a person should go about things, but more. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does for him his needs, which means when we daven as our first priority in the morning, and then we tackle the day and the challenges that we encounter, God helps us through those encounters and challenges. Shneimar, how do we know that? Because the verse says, He goes and he puts the righteousness in front of him. And God places his steps in front of him. God will set righteousness before him and satisfy all his wishes when he sets out on his way. So this passage is telling us two things. One is telling us the way that we should behave. And two, it's telling us when we behave in that way that God actually sets about our direction for our day's activities and he helps us through them. Therefore, the first thing that we need to do earliest in the morning is to dive into Hashem. We can just think about that for a moment. A person who wants to fulfill this mitzvah in the best possible manner, as we learned before, can dive in the special prayer known as nates, which means to say that he davens his Shemona Esra at the very earliest time possible, which is just as the sun rises. Now, if a person davens at that time, then he will have to, of course, get up to make sure that he has at least 20 to perhaps 30 minutes ahead of him before that time so that he can put the filling on and daven what he needs to do. That already takes us back another half an hour. Plus, perhaps he has to drive to shul or he has to walk to shul. It takes us another 20 minutes or 10 minutes or however long it takes, etc., etc. And he has to still get up and make sure he's prepared. So, therefore, even if he gets up very early, there's really no excuse for having time to engage in other activities before davening. One should make one's fullest effort first thing in the morning. That one, when one gets up immediately, his first thing on his mind is to serve Hashem, davening, putting the tefillin on, and thereafter God will help him to be successful throughout the day. The personalities, according to the notes over here, who was Rabbi Yoina, who we learned about over here? He was saying that anybody who makes his chafatzav, all of his needs, before he prays, it's as if he built a bama, and of course he didn't really say that. But anyway, 
uh, one of the great, he is one of the great Amoraim of Eretz Israel. Rabbi Yoyna lived in the third generation of Amoraim and was the primary student of Rabbi, Ze Rabbi Zeira. Rabbi Yoyna was among the prominent sages of his generation in Eretz Israel and was famous for his Torah erudition as well as his extreme righteousness. According to the Babylonian Talmud, which we're learning, he was one of the mighty of Eretz Israel. However, he was exceedingly humble and did not flaunt his greatness. Various stories illustrate his righteousness and describe miracles performed through the power of his prayer. His statements are rarely cited in the Babylonian Talmud. However, from the Jerusalem Talmud, it is clear that he was one of the pillars of Torah in his generation, and many halachic statements are cited in his name. Most sages of the following generations in Eretz Israel were his students who transmitted his teachings. Rabbi Yonah's son, Rabbi Mana, was one of the renowned sages of the next generation. Let's just take a look at these halachot before we continue. Tasting does not require a blessing. If one takes a taste from a dish and spits it out, he need not recite a blessing at all, even if he tasted more than a quarter of a log. If he intends to swallow more than a quarter of a log, he must recite a blessing bef before tasting it. If he intends to swallow less than a quarter of a log, some say that he need not recite a blessing, while others say that he does. The Ramah rules that one need not recite a blessing because the halakha is lenient with regards to blessings in cases of uncertainty, a great principle in the laws of rabbinical mitzvot in general, that we have safek brachot, safek rabbanan lehakel, or lekula. When we have a doubt about a rabbinical injunction, a rabbinical mitzvah, we say don't go ahead and do what you have to do because presumably you might have already done it and it's not correct to go and do it again or if you're in doubt about it, you shouldn't really do it in any case. When it comes to suffix de orisa, when it comes to a doubt in a Torah obligation, we must be strict and even if a person did do it before but he's forgotten and he's not sure what happened, he must still do it again presumably because he's not sure if he did it. But when it's a problem of a rabbinical halacha, he does not do it. The, the halachas of brachot are all rabbinical in nature, with the exception of birkat mazon after eating bread, and with the exception of birkat Torah, which we recite in the early morning before beginning our day, are uh, the blessing of the Torah. Other than that, all other brachot are rabbinical in nature, and when in doubt, we have a principle, a halacha, that we do not say the bracha. And so therefore, because over here he's in doubt, should he make the bracha when he tastes, or shouldn't he? Since it's rabbinical in nature, he does not make the blessing. One who is fasting tastes, and it is of no concern, as we learned before. One who is fasting may taste up to a quarter of a log, as long as he spits it out. On Yom Kippur and the ninth of Av, even that is prohibited. Others are strict and refrain from tasting on all communal fast days, and that is the common practice. Anyone who greets another person before he prayed, one is prohibited from going to greet someone at his home before reciting the morning prayer. If he met him by chance, he may greet him, but not include Shalom in the greeting as it is one of God's names. And so therefore, the correct thing to say, for example, is Tzafra Tava Demara. Good morning, sir, in the Aramaic. Tzafra Tava, that's what they say in the Halakha. Good morning, sir, that's the correct thing to say. But not to say Shalom, because Shalom is God's name, and one shouldn't use God's name in this greeting if one has not yet greeted God himself. A person is prohibited to attend to his own affairs before he prays. Once the time for prayer has arrived, one may not attend to his own affairs or to travel before he prays. This law applies equally to all prayers. So that means to say, Mincha, Ma'ariv, and of course, Shacharit, the moment the time for the prayer comes about, one should be careful to engage in the prayer itself and not involve oneself in extra affairs when it could be, accidentally, that the extra affairs, of course, will distract one. And ultimately, as a result, one will lose out on praying, one will get tired, come home, forget to pray, and the entire day will have gone by and one will have lost out on one's prayer. Let us read just one more point here because it's so beautiful, we can end off on a very beautiful teaching. For Omar Rabbi Yena, Omar Rabbi Zaira, Rabbi Yena said, that Rabbi Zaira said, Call Alan Shivas Yamim Belo Chalom. Anybody 
who sleeps seven days. He goes seven days. Without a dream, Nikra, he's called bad. Because the Pasuk says, the Saveya Yalin Bali Paked Ra, which means he has a satiation uh, or whatever it is exactly, and he lies down, and he it says that he will not be visited by evil. Altikre Saveya Elasheva. Don't read it as Saveya, meaning satiated, but read it as Shiva, seven. Anybody who sleeps for seven days, which means to say that he, he receives his, in other words, as long as he gets, he has a proper sleep within the seven days, he has the dream, so no bad will come to him. One who sleeps for seven nights without being visited by a dream is called evil. I'll just read it again. He who has it, the translation here is not 100% correct. I have to look at it inside just to see how it's expressed. Who has it will abide satisfied. He will not be visited by evil. What does that mean exactly? Rabbi Yone inter interprets this verse, do not read Saveya satisfied, but Sheva, seven, which means one who sleeps for seven nights. Bali Paket, oh, sorry, Bali Paket, and he does not have any remembrance. Ra. It's bad. If he doesn't have the dream, Bali Paket, the Saveya Yalin, Bali Paket, and he goes with the seven days and he doesn't get a remembrance, he doesn't have this mention of the dream, Ra, it is bad for him. Altikre Saveya, don't read it as satisfied. Ela Sheva, read it as seven, which means he goes seven days without a dream. Omale Rav Acha Bered Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Rav Acha. The son of Rabbi Chia, the son of Abba, said to him, Hachi Omar Rabbi Chia, Omar Rabbi Yochanan. This is what Rabbi Chia said, that Rabbi Yochanan said, Kol HaMasbiya Atzmo Medivrei Torah Velan. Anybody who satiates himself with the words of Torah and then goes to sleep. Ein Mevasrim Oto Besoros Raot. They do not give him any bad tidings. Which means to say, uh, probably we're referring to his sleep, that he won't have bad dreams. Shanae Maris, it says, A person who goes to sleep in satisfaction, which means he, he studies some Torah before he goes to sleep. And the words of Torah and the sats that he sees of those words on the page remain with him as he closes his eyes. He will not have any mention, he will not have any remembrance, he will not be visited for anything related to bad. We're going to stop over here. We've reached the end of this point. It's a very beautiful idea. So what, what we're saying over here is ultimately it's a good sign to dream and it's a bad sign not to dream. Seven days without a dream is not a good sign at all. And that's our basic principle that we've left off for over here. And we'll continue this theme of the Kriyat Shema and the interruptions and so on and so forth in our next Shi'ur. In the meantime, I say thank you very much for joining me. I'm Elia Oshir from Chesed Be'emet. My site can be found at www.lovingkindness.co and I welcome you to be in touch with me about any matters of Torah, life, growth. Join me for a Shi'ur, join us for a Shi'ur over here or join me for a private Shi'ur in the subject of your choice. Uh, if you've enjoyed the Shi'ur, please like my video by clicking on the thumbs up button underneath the video and please subscribe to my channel click on the bell button and be notified of future shiurim if you have any comments that you'd like to make preferably uh, good comments uh, praise in, in, in enjoyment that you've enjoyed the shiur something positive please do share it in the comment section tell me what you're up to tell me what you're learning what are you getting out of these shiurim ask me a question let's discuss it in the comment section below i'd be delighted to discuss it with you of course if you have gained from the Shi'urim and you want to become a part of some of the activities that we're involved in, please also go to my website and become a member of Chesed Ve'emet by making a contribution each month to helping us so that we can provide more of these videos and to be able to share more Torah without having to worry about how to earn the income in order to be able to offer these Shi'urim as we do at this point in time. They're all offered at no cost to anybody. So I thank you for joining me and I look forward to another Shi'ur with you in the near future and feel free to be in touch. I wish you everything of the best. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.